Welcome and greetings from Washington, D.C. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Director of Policy and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. On behalf of our team at OIA, thank you for joining us for OIA Conversations, where we share information and learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the U.S. territories and to the freely associated states. I'm joined today by Philippe Izadian, a Duke University student who provides uh, important assistance for this series. Today, we will be having a conversation with Earl Campbell, who holds a PhD and is currently an Associate Regional Director for the National Park Service in Natural Resource Stewardship and Science. Mr. Campbell manages regions three, four, and five, which are the Great Lakes, Mississippi River Basin, and the Missouri River Basin. Today, however, we will be talking about Guam. So for many years, Earl Campbell has worked on the Brown Tree Snake Program. Thank you, Earl, for joining us today. Thank you for asking me. It's one of my favorite programs. <laughs> so, so Earl, um, you have worked for many years on the Brown Tree Snake Program, a program which the Office of Insular Affairs, a lot of funding goes through this office for, this, for the program. Can you please tell us how you got started? Yeah, I sure can. I'd be happy to. Um, you know, it actually starts with another set of territories. Um, so I was uh, doing my master's degree. I was a zookeeper and I worked with, with snakes. I was a reptile keeper. So I started when I was 15. And um, when I finished my undergraduate degree and I was a full-time keeper, I was working with breeding rare snakes. And the snake was the Virgin Island tree boa. So that led me to work in the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico on that species for a bit of time. And, um, and I was looking at what caused it, that species of snake to be rare. And it turned out it was rats and you know changing in habitat and things like that. And I decided I wanted to do a graduate research on that and get a PhD and got accepted to school. And unfortunately, Hurricane Hugo and funding cuts killed my degree. So I was unable to continue, but accepted in school. So I sent out, I think it was like 260 letters to different people who worked on snakes and islands and rats. And I got only two responses back. And one of the responses came from a gentleman named Tom Fritz. And he at the time, worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and he was stationed at the Smithsonian. And he said he was interested in me. Um, could I please come to visit? But he had no money. <laughs> but, but so I drove out to the Smithsonian from Ohio, where I was living. And Tom talked to me about the project in Brown Tree Snakes. And at that time, it had just gotten published that Brown Tree Snakes had caused the extinction of most of the forest birds on Guam. And people were just starting to learn about some of the other impacts. And the Department of Interior was just getting involved. What year? 1989, 1990. And, and so, I was, so I kept in touch with Tom. He had no money, just to be clear. And the first set of money that Office of Insular Affairs got, I was hired a, you know, a larger amount. I ended up getting a summer job going out to Guam and they had this thing called the, the Guam sweep snakes. It was a snake rodeo. And I was sent out and OIA paid for me to help the herpetologists at Guam Division of Aquatic Wildlife um, work with the snakes that people were turning in at fire stations. And so the thing that we learned from that was from a science perspective is that bounties are collecting snakes you know, or paying people to collect snakes or harvest them just don't work on Guam. And the science thing that's behind that that we learn later is even though they're very common in many places, they're hard to detect. But that was my first introduction to Guam and the brown tree snake. And then I got, I came back and had to wait to see if there was more funding for me to work on things. And uh, there was a little bit of DOD funding and OIA funding, and that's it got me back the next year to Guam, and I started living on Guam at that point doing my dissertation. So I go way, way back to the beginning, and, and we, we didn't have money, so this is a program that's larger, but I, I slept on friends' floors wow. and things like that. So it was a neat experience. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you said you you came out in the 90s, at that point, the, the, the bird population on Guam was already decimated, but it hadn't, uh, it, it was just barely beginning. Well, um, the bird population, it, it's really f rather sad what happened on Guam. And a lady called Julie Savage is the person who worked that out. And that was her dissertation. And she finished it in the mid 80s. But she saw a pattern of uh, bird decline over Guam. So ultimately, she learned the snake was a problem and did surveys of the public on Guam. And they could you, then the amazing thing was a map that showed, you know, over time, starting in the, the above the port area, you see this contraction of almost everything bird wise. And it expands through, you know, through the from about about 1950s. And this is people who are citizens telling Julie in surveys, when was the last time they saw certain birds around their property. And by the, the late, by the mid 80s, you ended up having the decline, the last decline of the birds on northern Guam. And when you look at it, most bird populations are, are, are reasonably dense for, for forest birds on, in the Marianas. So if you can imagine that you end up having a lot of birds, but if you were to go back a quarter mile and there's nothing, it's silent. The, 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 the level of impact when the snakes, you know, were coming in, it was almost like a wave. Um, and, you know, by 85, the northern tip of Guam, all the, all the birds, forest birds were gone. The other thing that happened was significant impacts to all the native um, lizards and seabirds were significantly impacted too. So it was broad scale impacts, but then you look at the other impacts that were occurring to the public. And, you know, that's where you start thinking about power outages and patterns of snake bites on infants and things like that. And, you know, particularly at that period of time, they were quite distinct. Now, when you, uh, you said you then came back to, uh, to the U.S. after that first uh, moment on Guam, uh, what was then, was it then congressionally funded? Um, was the first I don't time? think we, I don't, th I think it was technical assistance funds from OIA and you know, I think there was some funding from DOD, but I think it was project specific. It really wasn't until, um, you know, my first year living on Guam, so 1991, that there was more solid money. Um, but, you know, it says early 90s that the funding started to come in and there was work by the Hawaii Congressional Delegation and the Pacific Basin Development Council. So a lady named Carolyn Imamura, uh, who was with them at the time, and the Hawaiian congressionals in particular, that got congressional ads. So from my understanding, uh, Senator Inouye, Inouye was, played a significant role in getting ads to both the uh, insular affairs budget as well as the uh, budget for the Department of Defense. And so that early period you know, there was work by the congressionals and others on that. And that changed things uh, after a while because there weren't any control programs where there were, there were very, there was very limited work. Um, you know, Tom Fritz, who deserves a ton of credit for, he's the person I credit the most for why we don't have snakes across a broad landscape because Julie was the one that found the problem, but Tom was the one working with OIA and others that really raised it because he was stationed in DC. And, you know, I think he's the person that saved many places during his role, working in particular with Dave Hagestad, who was um, an individual who worked for Office of Insular Affairs for a while. But, you know, it was a group of people, just like any period of time here, it's not one person, you're talking to me, but you really have to think of the suite of people that as a team that are working. And you know, in this case, the early group of people were uh, Tom, Dave, Carolyn Imamura. Um, and uh, you know, they were really the, the folks I see starting it out. And later we started to have USDA and some really good DOD people helping us. So it's been a collaborative effort and it's shifted 
over the years I've been there, <laughs> but yeah, really great indeed. people. So I'm just, I'm lucky to work with all of them. They're, they're the people that save stuff. Yes. And thank you for highlighting that indeed it is a group effort and we, we are speaking with you uh, and, and appreciate your, you know, your giving us a little bit of this history uh, because I don't know that too many people are aware of it and people come and go and, and some people have moved on or retired. So um, before you go further, uh, tell us why uh, Hawaii, the Hawaii delegation might be interested in this. There's a bit of a history on this. When you look at the impact of, of, of the snake, the first thing is you think about the biology and it's a nocturnal snake. Um, so, you know, it's, it's out a lot of times at night. They're, they, they have, they're averse to losing, uh, he, the loss of water is a significant thing. So they're foraging at night when there's a lot of moisture, but during the day they hide in things. So you think about snakes being super abundant uh, on Guam in many places. And at the time they were highly abundant. You know, I mean, you think about Guam being a center of shipping, the snakes were taking refuge in things being shipped off Guam. So if you look at the pattern in the early 90s, there was eight snakes found in Hawaii. And so, you know, Hawaii was getting arrivals of those. There was a concern, particularly after you started to look at the pattern of electrical power outages that occurred on Guam. Uh, a number of entities started to push and saying, you know, we need to figure out how to stop snakes from getting off Guam. And we don't want to repeat the bird loss. And, you know, I think it's, this is an issue in, uh, Many people look at this as a conservation issue because of the bird loss, but I will say that if you look at the electrical power outages that occurred and who started pushing to get support, it was actually Guam Power Authority pulled together the first broader meetings that had Guam Division of Aquatic and Wildlife and you know, different people from the, the, the island of Guam who were impacted. The federal government was brought in. They were contacting and reaching out to OIA and, and the delegate's office. But a guy named Oliver Wood, and his nickname was Woody, um, you know, he really pushed to get better organization. And the first templates, a template for uh, a working agreement between entities, actually, you know, it was Guam Power Authority that played a very significant role in that in getting you know, people to look at it. So you have the economic driver and the thing that people need to realize is the scale of power outages was quite significant. Um, so what are these snakes doing? Chewing up power lines? The snakes end up crawling up. These snakes are very good at climbing. So that's the first thing. They, they're, they're called a tree snake. Um, so, but the thing is on Guam, one of the limited places that you still would have a few birds around is up on the power poles, they, they make nests on the insulating couplers. So there are no birds anywhere. And for snakes, one of the drives is to get, you know, good caloric content. And those birds are yummy, as well as all the geckos going up and down things. So the snakes basically would go up the guy wires of the power poles and then try to get up and then they'd be crossing along and they'd short out the power lines. Mm. And they still do that on Guam, just to be clear. So that's yeah. a continuing problem, but the problem has changed not in, not in, in to a fair degree due to changes in the power system on Guam versus mm. the snake's numbers or behavior changing. Could you repeat that again? It's it's more the it's not the behavior. It's more the, uh, so. The if you look at the number of snake power outages on Guam, you know, and, and you know, I I was thinking it was, it, and this is off the top of my head. You know, I think there was at one point one every two days or something like that. And the military also has their own records, but it's significant. Mm -hmm. So snakes crawl up. Well, on Guam, when I started, the power line power system was centralized. So you have the big power plant in Tangisan, a power line going up the, the island and everything coming off of that. Mm -hmm. And if for folks that have lived and worked uh, in Guam or in the Marianas for a long time, people will recall that that was a period where we just got walloped by typhoons. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening in the mid 90s is the power system got more decentralized 
because of the damage that occurred to Tangisan and the power generation facilities due to the storms, they put in these smaller generators. And so the grid became decentralized. So you're not going to lose the main line. You, you're going to lose small parts. So currently the pattern, they're still having snake power outages and it hasn't been looked at in a bit of time, but you know, the relative rate of power outages was similar to that early period, but it's neighborhoods that are getting the powers being taken out versus the main power line. When I started, you know, you'd have the main power line on Guam getting taken out. Right. And so even today, there's still that's still happening. It's it's still happening. So when you look at the concern and we go back to, you know, what is a concern for other Pacific islands? You know, I think it is a relevant one, particularly for places that have centralized power, mm -hmm. that getting the snake established there could cause significant problems due to power problems. And that's where you look at Oahu, mm -hmm. it has centralized power the distribution. You look at Saipan, centralized power distribution. They didn't decentralize it like Guam did. Um, so, you know, for me, the snake story is a power story and power distribution is a biosecurity story because you now have teams that search for snakes to get get them off Guam. It's an ecological story because you think about the large scale impacts that the snake has had because you no longer have birds. You don't have certain things on the island. And in certain places now you have introduced birds that have, have expanded in certain areas, but the forests are pretty depauperative of, of, of birds. Tell me where this um, brown tree snake comes from? How did it, when did it come first come to Guam? So um, the, there, we believe in the we is a, a number of people that have worked on, on it. So it's the work of, of a number of real good folks um, that there are three different lines of evidence that show that the snake ended up coming probably from the island of Manaus, um, which is uh, part of the Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. So the, the island is really important historically because it's a place that the U.S. military built a base to stage for the Battle of, of the Coral Sea. So, you know, for us to be successful during World War II, we needed that facility. So you go forward a little bit of time and people were disassembling the facility and it's after World War II, immediately after it. And they just basically took the scrap of the Quonset huts and things like that and loaded them straight onto an aircraft carrier or two. I don't know the number of it. Mm -hmm. And those were shipped up to Guam and all the inventory work was done on Guam. Wow. So at that time, um, my understanding is there was a report of snakes, but nobody knew what they were. <laughs> Um, that were that were cited or reported associated with it. It wasn't something major, like one snake or something, but there's a record of somebody noticing that. That material all was then shipped to, to Taiwan. So it didn't even remain on Guam, most of it. It was inventoried on Guam and shipped to, to Taiwan uh, for use by Chiang Kai-shek. So, so the first line of evidence That's is funny. actually people, you know, a, a report you know, of things, but it actually had been misidentified for many years until Julie Savage did her work mm -hmm. and folks were calling it the Philippine rat snake. snake. So now does Taiwan have uh, the brown tree? No, snake? it doesn't. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. okay. So the other two lines of evidence that sort of support this are, um, you know, later there was a guy named Gordon Rada who did field work in uh, Papua New Guinea and, and the Solomons in Manos. And he actually caught snakes down there and looked at museum collections. And herpetologists look at scale counts and similarities of scales. And the best match for morphologically, what something looks like, is that site for Gordon's work. And so that's, you know, when I started, you know, that's 90s technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we go up to now, when we have DNA technology or RNA technology, all these fancier tools, people have redone the work and run the tissues of things to say, you know, how close are these, you know, sort of like, you know, the, the type of things that we use with ancestry to find out who we're yeah. related to. Right. And in that case, the, the, the 
that type of data um, shows the, D, the RNA data or the, that type of technology shows that there's a parallel uh, match with that the Manas and then the coast of New Guinea Solomon's that's right on the other near the island. But you know you have three lines of evidence that really mesh up well. Right. Um, so let's move forward to a little bit more recent, uh, Earl. The, now there are several federal partners who are working together along with Guam and the CNMI. Can you speak to us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good group of federal partners working together. So the first partner that I think should be mentioned, and I'll go from a departmental perspective first, because I think that's, that's the easiest way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, you have the Department of Interior, the Department of Defense, and USDA are the three federal departments. The other key things is at this point, you really do need to recognize the territories and the government of Guam is, is a significant partner and always has been in this, as well as the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands uh, is a significant partner in the state of Hawaii is. So, you know, when I look at the group, you've got um, six, three departments and three territorial and state governments that work together to a different degree. Within the Department of Interior, um, you know, there are different roles. There's um, the Office of Insular Affairs, which has provided significant leadership and is the primary funder for this issue. Um, so, you know, since I started and when I talked about, you know, funds coming in, much of the funding has come directly to the Office of Insular Affairs. And I, I will say that early on, and even up into the last probably five years, you know, I, OIA really was the most significant funder um, for the issue. And if it hadn't been for the support we got from OIA, we would be having problems. So OIA and, you know, the staff that have supported us deserve great credit. Um, the next group that works on brown tree snakes uh, is uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. And so that's the research arm. They do the bio, they have a unit um, that does biological research. And so they have people that have been doing work for many years. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things to remember is government agencies change their names and t-shirts, but the people <laughs> remain the same. So that gentleman, Tom Fritz was a Fish and Wildlife Service employee. And that mm -hmm. part of Fish and Wildlife became USGS. Oh, so okay. there's continuity from Tom all the way up through the guy Gordon that I mentioned to the people that are doing work right now on the ground. So great group of people. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service has a significant role. They are the folks that do coordination. And so they also have a regulatory role. So there's a legal driver for a lot of the actions that occur with brown tree snakes. And so they have a regulatory role. So then we shift and I'll go to the Department of Defense and the Department of Defense in part because, you know, there's so much shipping for the Department of Defense on Guam and their major landowner, they have had consistently a significant role in supporting research early on. Uh, they've got staff now doing work uh, dedicated on brown tree snakes, um, but, you know, their role has really increased over time and, you know, all those folks deserve credit. And, you know, there are people in the beginning that really worked hard to start things out. So again, DOD is a major player. And then USDA, uh, Wildlife Services, is an entity that does the control at the commercial port and airport, and they catch snakes from going onto planes and things like that. So I think they've got thir 13 dogs, and the dogs help both DOD and non-DOD property, and Wildlife Services does a trapping on civilian stuff and DOD does their own trapping, but you know it's an integrated program. Uh, and then there's a research arm that develops chemical tools for control and also works on biology called the National Wildlife Research Center that's part of USDA. So when you think about it, it's a really complex family, federal family that works generally well together and it's a tough mission, but all the people working for it do great. And then you also look at the complementary partners for the government of Guam, CNMI and Hawaii. So it's a team effort. And, and you know, when I was coordinating it, you know, you, you sort of think about about 70 people I was directly touching. Uh, 
you know, where I was working with them, you know, on a, every two weeks to four weeks. And nice. so neat group of people. I was glad, very glad I had the experience to work with all those people. Yes. And uh, for our listeners, the OIA provides between four to five million roughly uh, every year to the Brown Tree Snake Program. It, it has been many years, Earl. If we could talk a little bit about the decimation of birds and, and other mammals perhaps on Guam. Could you speak to us more about that and what that means for the island of Guam? Yeah, I can. Um, you know, I think when, when I think about what's occurred to Guam, you know, the, the, we've, we've lost almost all the native forest birds. So when you, when you go north, for instance, to Saipan, or you go just the island immediately north, Rota, you know, you have this full complement of, of different forest birds, you know, and you think about it and they're different sizes and they feed differently. All those things are missing. Mm -hmm. So you have the complete decimation of, of all the forest birds. Um, and, you know, there are a limited number of things, but, you know, the distribution isn't high. But you think about the functions that these things do. So you think about pollination, you think about, um, in, you know, they're insectivorous, they eat spiders, they do a range of things. You think of energy flow and, you know, there's a complete change uh, in what has happened. So you look at, at seed dispersal and you think about how birds influence what plants you have in your forest. All that is gone. You don't have the birds that move the seeds, you don't have the bats, you know, and you look at mammals, fruit bats, which are found on Guam, you know, disperse seeds, they're not there. So you see a significant change in the force of Guam over time, because there's a selection of things in the forest away from stuff that's dispersed by things that, that are now extinct. So you, you're, or, you know, they aren't extinct on Guam. So you, you're seeing major changes in the, in the forest. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know there, is a, there are a few Micronesian kingfishers in different zoos, maybe even with the Smithsonian in DC. Uh, it, part, is that part of an effort to, to sort of keep, the bird, keep those birds yeah. alive and hopefully yeah. bring them back? Is that, is that an option at all? I, I th personally, I think it is an option. So, but I think one of the things that people have been working on is how do you control snakes on the landscape? Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have been do, developing tools like traps, you know, that those traps are used around ports and airports, they remove snakes, they're toxicants that are now used. So people use uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol, 80 milligrams. So that's what's in a baby Tylenol is what's been registered for snake control. And that's put in a, a dead baby mouse. Mm. And so those are put out and people have been looking at how do you replace the, the dead mouse with fake mouse or things that are cheaper, but, you know, we have some tools that work and, um, and people are also looking at how do you disperse things across the landscape with helicopters, so that bait. Mm -hmm. So there is work to get rid of snakes on the landscape, develop those tools. And I think those things are going well. Um, and if we are able to remove the snakes from certain size areas, we can bring things back. Mm -hmm. and, and people have done that across many areas in, in, in the Pacific. New, Ze New Zealand does that quite a bit for rat control. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing the tool, the pest is new. Mm -hmm. The tools in many ways, people have done this and worked it out doing different systems. So Earl, are we at the point, uh, how would you describe, are we, are we controlling it? Is it are we, are we reducing it? Uh, there, I'm, I understand there's no such thing as complete eradication. Well, you know, the first thing I'll say is I, I look at the brown tree snake story right now as a success. And, you know, I have a personal bias. It's been my life for a long time. But when I think about success, when we started out, one of the key things is we, the people who started this out, and I guess I'm part of those folks, did not want to repeat what happened on Guam in other areas. So except for one situation, I'll mention it at the end of this, you know, we do not have snakes that we know of established in the CNMI. We don't have them established 
in Hawaii. So once we built up these quarantine programs and people started to stop snakes, I think we've really stopped it or reduced the risk to places significantly. And I think that you know all those people, everybody together is a reason why this is a success across all the agencies and over many years. So this is a work of, of a great number of people. Um, and, but the other thing that you look at is, um, you know, you look at control on Guam, because that's something that I think is really important. And, you know, people can do localized control, and that's where people are looking at, can we do things larger? The last thing is, I did mention, you know, one point, the island of Cocos, it's a small islet south of uh, the main island of Guam. Um, or Dano is the other name. It had, uh, it has, and it always has had during this whole problem, never had snakes on it. And people introduced the Guam rail on it. Um, and unfortunately, snakes were found on that island and it was a biosecurity breach. Mm -hmm. So the agencies that I talked about, the Interior and USDA agencies and the government of Guam are looking to do a, control the snakes on that site so they can keep everything in good shape. But you know, I think it'll be a good test to how well we can deal with an emergency. So, um, and the people are, are dealing with it right now. So as we speak. Um, and, and you know, given that Guam is such an important transportation hub in the Micronesia region uh, and directly to Hawaii, a little further away, uh, I, I would, agree with you that that it that's pretty amazing that there actually hasn't been uh more transmission of the snakes into other areas i i would agree i i think early on in my career so that would be the early 90s i think we just were really lucky and you know we got wildlife services standing up um and started to build up the dogs right around 93 94 and that program was small um and so it built but you know it, it the cooperation of the shippers in the commercial sector mm -hmm. and also the good work of DOD staff that are doing transport is, you know, got to be credited for this. And also when you think about it, the public education of the people who work in the ports and at the airport, you know, they're going to be them knowing that you got that a snake's not supposed to be there. And the same in a recipient site is the first line of defense. Yes. Yes. Um, before we move to let you have closing thoughts, Earl, I wanted to ask you about uh, maybe some of the people who have come out of your program. Uh, you've talked a lot about people in the past, but how about people going forward? Maybe people who are working on uh, different aspects of brown tree snake and, and, and these environmental issues. Yeah, I think that's it's really important because you, 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 I'll start with myself first, um, but you know, my education and my career really was supported by OAA and DOD. And, you know, and I did this work for years. But since then, there have been a lot of people who have had careers in biology um, or got, spun off and done business or a range of things. But we've had so many people working in this area that have spun off and now we're doing, you know, different careers. So, um, you know, we've got folks that are students in graduate school that are working on projects looking at snake impacts. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, we have, uh, there's more and more of an emphasis on trying to bring people that are local working in on this issue. So you do look at the, the science agencies real, shifting their staffing to more and more Guam-based hiring because the key thing is we need to raise the next generation of folks that are working on this issue. And personally, you know, in my career, you know, I've mentored a number of people when I was working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and they now have careers working on natural resources that, you know, that came out locally, worked with me, and now they've got their own careers doing a whole range of stuff. So I think that the people that are coming out for the future are, the, are probably the best product of this next to the snake control um, and not having snakes elsewhere, but it's the people that, that we've developed and they're now working elsewhere. 
Earl, I wanted to thank you. I had a, a conversation with a team at Iowa State University uh, just a couple of, actually earlier today, um, there are a couple of students from Guam who are um, actually studying for their PhDs and I'm hoping to have a conversation with them to follow up on, on how they started with the Brown Tree Snake Program. Great, I'm looking forward to, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear it because I like those people. They're great, <laughs> <laughs> I'm biased. <laughs> Um, Earl, do you have, are there any other points that we should know about the Brown Tree Snake uh, program on Guam? Um, you know, I, I think I've covered a lot of the history and things, but, you know, when I look at it, um, you know, I do have to really at this point, because I'm nearing the end of my career, it's funny, um, but there are a lot of people that have worked very hard on this. So you start out with, you know, the name Julie Savage and what she did, and then Tom Fritz, who, you know, I really think from the management and research perspective, you know, he really is the, the champion that doesn't get mentioned enough, but then it builds off. And, you know, the, the program early on and even at this time has been diverse. It's had a great number of people that have been extremely dedicated. And so I think about the people who, you know, work for the government of Guam, the people in the CNMI I've worked with, you know, folks in the state of Hawaii, then you look at everybody that's worked for the GS, the USGS team, and then you go to the OIA employees, and I think you know definitely Dave Hagestat, um, Charlene Lazar, um, Tiffany Taylor, uh, Faraday Craft, and Haley McCoy mm -hmm. deserve tons and tons of credit. So those people I really like. So all those those folks, but then you you shift to everybody who's worked for. You know the diff, you, the other agencies USDA and, and USDA NWRC. This has been a group effort, so I may have to redo this whole one. <laughs> oh no worries, um, Earl. This is sort of a, a kind of a side question, but I wondered if you had any thoughts about the brown tree snake uh, versus the coconut rhinoceros beetle, and what you can say about that. Well, you know, I I will say I have a challenge when people people ask me, you know, what's worse. Um, both things are bad. Um, and so it really depends on what part of society you're, you're focusing on. I think if coconut rhinoceros beetle gets to places where coconut uh, uh, is a food source that's needed, that's a significant issue because people rely on that. Um, when I look at the brown tree snake, you know, it's going to wipe out all, it's going to wipe out all your, all, all your birds. It's going to change your ecology. Um, and then you look at the power outages and the human health things. You know, the other one that I think really needs to get raised in there is introduced ants. There are a number of ants that are very problematic that make it hard to do, you know, to do local agriculture. Um, the, the little fire ant that's currently on the Big Island and, and limited other places in Hawaii has really decimated the uh, industries, other places on islands. So, you know, I, I think of all of those things just being truly bad. And actually there are a little fire ant on Guam right now. So that's Yes, yes. And I just wanted to say um, that we, we have provided some funds to, to do research to counter the little fire ant. I believe the funds went to the University of Guam. Um, but the other thing I would just share is that we had a conversation, another OIA conversation on the coconut rhinoceros beetle uh, with folks from, Yo uh, from Rota and the CNMI uh, Department of Lands and Natural Resources. So they had talked about uh, this, the coconut rhinoceros beetle coming to Rota and, and the devastation that it has had, uh, the impact it has had on Guam. Yeah, and, and I, I think for me, these are all big baddies. <laughs> you don't want any of them. And then, and uh, so, what, you know, I, I, can't, I can't pick which one's the worst. They all are bad. <laughs> yeah. And if I could sort of jump back to your point about um, one point that I like to make about uh, federal agencies, and, and you can disagree with me, Earl, but I think one good thing about the Office of Insular Affairs is our focus is on the island areas 24-7. That, that's what we do 365 days a year. Many of the team of the folks in the Office of Insular Affairs, past and present, uh, that's probably how they've been quite helpful to you and to this program mm -hmm. is that that's the focus is it's all uh, we focus on the insular areas. 
I would agree. And, you know, I think OIA's role supporting the, the people of, you know, Guam and the CNMI, as well as, you know, the, the other places, you know, I knew of OIA's role when I was down in the Virgin Islands. So, um, you know, it's a significant entity that provides a link of support. So, you know, you know, I'm a great fan. <laughs> Thank you um, for your interest in snakes, Earl, that led you to, to our world, to the islands. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, you know, I will say again, I appreciate the help that OIA has given me. And I also appreciate the help that all these people have, have, you know, there's so many people that have worked on it. So I'm, I'm just speaking for them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for your time, Earl. Okay. See you later. <laughs>